So good evening, everyone, and welcome you all to the Flavor of the Month CME series on management of retinal detachment. This is our tenth series, and I am the moderator for today. I am Dr. Rekha Priya, a vitreo retinal consultant working at Agarwal Eye Hospital, Salem branch. Uh, so I would like to thank the clinical board and Dr. Preeti Ma'am for giving me this opportunity, and I would also like to thank the clinical board for choosing this topic for discussion today. So we have two eminent speakers today, Dr. Nitin uh, Prabhu Desai sir and Dr. Jayashree ma'am, who will be discussing about the management of uh, strategies for retinal detachment. So the first topic will be the uh, role of scleral buckling in uh, regmatogenous retinal detachment by Dr. Nitin Prabhu Desai sir. So it is my honor and privilege sir to welcome you to the session today. So uh, Dr. Nitin Prabhu Desai sir has more than 30 years of clinical experience and is currently working at Agarwal Eye Hospital, uh, Pune. He is an alumni of uh, Topiwala National Medical College, Nair Hospital, Mumbai. He had done his super specialty training in medical and surgical management of vitreoretinal disease at uh, Shankar Netralia, Chennai. He is also the founder of uh, Prabhu Desai Eye Clinic. And uh, in spite of his busy private practice, uh, sir is actively involved in all the academic activities. He is an active member of Pune Ophthalmologic Society, Maharashtra Ophthalmologic Society, All India Ophthalmologic Society, and is the founder member of Retina Interest Group Pune. He's also an international member of the prestigious American Academy of Ophthalmology. So it is a pleasure having you, sir, today. Uh, over to you, sir, to present about scleral buckling. Thank you, Rekha, for the kind introduction. It's my privilege to be here today with you all to discuss this uh, interesting topic of management of retinal detachment with the help of scleral buckle. As you all know, uh, I am practicing this surgery for the last 30 years. And uh, in the recent times, there has been a little bit of, you would say, uh, interesting debate whether scleral buckle still has some role in management of retinal detachment with uh, improving techniques of retinal surgery. And this point has become more prominent. However, over the years, we have seen that though the technique of scleral buckle has not changed much, it still has a role in management of primary regmatogenous retinal detachment. So in the next few minutes, I'd like to share some of my views and experience over the last 30 years on this particular topic. So let's first see where does scleral buckle really come into play when you have conditions like this, when there is a partial regmatogenous retinal detachment in the temporal half of the retina involving the macula and a single hole seen in the lattice in the temporal periphery, this is an ideal situation to consider a scleral buckle. Similarly, you have uh, additional, you can see uh, again a partial detachment with a temporal horseshoe shaped tear. Again, this is a good indication for considering a scleral buckle surgery. Now, this patient underwent surgery and on the first post-operative day, you can see that the retina is well attached and well supported by the buckle. About one month post-op, you can see that the retina is still well attached. The buckle element is well seen and even along with that, you can see the encircling effect also. So these are the situations where just by doing scleral buckle, you can get good anatomical as well as visual results. Even if you have multiple breaks, you can see here in this picture, there's a temporal detachment involving the macula where there is a large horseshoe shaped tear at around 11 o'clock and next to it, there is additionally an atrophic hole. But both these detach, uh, holes can be managed with a scleral buckle surgeon. So if you look at the gross indications of scleral buckle, we have conditions where you have a definite break, single or multiple, absence of PVR, a young phakic patient. Now, this point comes when you are discussing retinal detachments in young patients as uh, scleral buckle vis a vis a uh, vitrectomy, where in young phakic patients, performing a vitrectomy and inducing a uh, PVD is a difficult task. So, in these patients, scleral buckle really plays a very important role. In aphakic patients, where the pupil dilates well and the vitreous is clear, I think scleral buckle is a good option because most of the time, the breaks are small and well into periphery where supporting them with a sterile buckle and bring the fluid gives good results. In pseudophagic patients, recently there has been a lot of work 
where it has been shown that doing a primary vitrectomy does quite well with, uh, with the results of attachment of the retina as well as visual improvements. However, in these patients also, if the pupil is dilating well, the vitreous is fairly clear, the breaks are in the periphery and not many breaks. In this case, or in these cases also, scleral buckle can be a good option to perform surgery. However, having said that, if you have situations like this, where there are multiple breaks, but you can see that breaks are quite large, they are posterior, they are horseshoe shaped tears with the rolled margins, no significant PVR, Vitreous is clear, but still supporting all these breaks with scleral buckle and achieving good anatomical uh, reattachment and avoiding recurrence of retachment due to PVR is a difficult task. So these cases are not good situations for considering scleral buckle. Similarly, when the PVR is almost up to D2 level or even up to D1 level, it's not a good idea to perform a scleral buckle. And definitely situation like this, where it's PVRD3, you do not consider scleral buckle. And in cases where there is giant retinal tear or a giant dialysis, again, scleral buckle is not an option to consider. Now, if you have an indication seen and you are planning a scleral buckle surgery, you have to have a good preoperative evaluation. I would say over the years that doing a good indirect ophthalmoscopy is a key to perform a good scleral buckle surgery. Almost half of your surgery is over if you do a good preoperative indirect ophthalmoscopy and if possible, do a proper detailed drawing. Again, in a busy private practice, people may not have time to do a proper detailed drawing, but having it done with any of your colleagues or from your fellows would be a good idea. And when I say proper retinal examination, it is you have to properly dilate the pupil, give some time and do a detailed depression. So you know where all the breaks are. You don't miss any breaks. You get an idea about the vitreous haze, the corneal uh, condition, the lens condition, if the patient is faking. So you can plan your surgery properly if you do a proper retinal evaluation in the pre-operative uh, duration. And you do a good retinal uh, drawing also. Now, why it is important? Because you can document your drawing. You can plan the treatment based on the drawing you have done. You can help when you are doing the surgery, you can keep the drawing in front of you and help in execute the treatment properly. Intraoperative localization becomes much easier because you don't focus in all the areas. You just focus where you have the problem seen in your drawing. And when you are reviewing the patient post-surgery or you are following up, if you have some problems seen that you see some fluid pocket or you see as a break which has not been supported, you can compare it with the drawing and know whether it was a pre-existing break or it's a new break. Also, in cases where you are practicing in a bigger setup where you have multiple consultants, the patient may be seen by someone and later on get come for operation with the other person. So in those situations, having a primary drawing helps in knowing how the retirement was before and how it is on the day of surgery. And if you do a, a color-coded drawing, it helps in coming to a surgical plan because just a quick look at the drawing, you know where the retinal detachment is, where the breaks and how you're going to support them. Now, when planning for surgery, usually for patients over 15 years of age, we would consider local anesthesia and if the patient is anxious, we would consider local along with sedation. And you have to discuss your case with your anesthetist so that you can give proper sedation because scleral buckle surgery does require good cooperation of the patient. A patient who has pain and discomfort would not make the situation very ideal. General anesthesia is considered for patients who are under 15 years of age or patients who are very anxious and other one category of patients who get claustrophobic because of the drapes. I think for them also general anesthesia should be considered. Now we'll look at the various uh, steps for the surgery. The first step for the surgery will be doing a good conjunctival peritomy. You start with the horizontal meridian and then go all around using proper uh, instrumentations. And when you uh, complete the 360 degree conjunctival peritomy, you will take radial cuts. This is very important because while hooking the muscles and then subsequently when you roll the eyeball with the help of muscle, you tend to stretch the conjunctiva and when you are putting your instruments inside to visualize the sclera properly, especially the retractors, 
in those situations also your conjunctiva gets stretched and you don't want it to be uh, disturbed and be ragged hence a good uh, cut and relax relaxing the conjunctiva is very important once conjunctiva peritoneum is over you dithermize and clean the area so that you don't have multiple oozing points throughout the surgery once the peritoneum is done you would like to then separate the intermuscular septum it is very important because unless you do that your hooking of the muscles will not be easy and again when you are examining the sclera it will be difficult to do so if your tissues are not well separated after you are do, you uh, clear the areas of in between the muscles you start hooking the muscles there is uh, usually we prefer to hook the inferior rectus first following by the horizontal recta and lastly you go to the superior rectus once the muscles are hooked you pass suture under the muscles so that you secure the muscle properly once all the four muscles are secured you start inspecting the sclera you know this is a very important step when you are going ahead with scleral buckle if your sclera especially in the area where you want to support the retina from behind with a buckle which is placed on the sclera if your sclera is thin it is it becomes very difficult to do so if the sclera is too thin obviously at times you may have to abandon the vitrectomy uh, sclerotic buckle procedure and consider vitrectomy then and there this situation does not arise so commonly but i remember at least once or twice in the last let's say a few years we have to shift from sclerotic buckle to a vitrectomy procedure so inspecting the sclera is extremely important before you start doing your other procedures once you have inspected the sclera and you see that things are okay and you can go ahead with the sclerotic buckle your first step would be to use an indirect ophthalmoscope and mark the breaks on the sclera again here you can use some uh, blunt tip instrument to mark the uh, uh, sclera with the in relation to the break which you see with indirect ophthalmoscopy and subsequently to make that break prominent either you can use a dithermy point or you can use a marking pen to demarcate the area of the break once you are uh, uh, you demarcate the breaks uh, you have to decide whether you are going to perform a implant technique or an explant technique again it it depends on the surgeon's choice what to consider but uh, uh, both techniques work well in the end the results with implant as well as explant have been shown to be almost similar i i prefer to perform implants in most situation because i am comfortable with it and uh, i don't think it is very time consuming because of years of practice you can perform scleral dissection quite uh, fast now when you decide to dissect the scleral flaps it is important that you have uh, the thickness of the sclera to, to a particular level usually you would intend to make an half thickness sclera flaps and the general principle is to cover at least 3 mm on all sides of the retinal break which you have marked on the sclera so that would give you a good coverage of the break and um, before you start the dissection i have just this one point that you would perform in the standard step of the procedure you would perform cryotherapy to treat those breaks from the sclera side once you are satisfied with the cryotherapy then you start going to the dissection of the uh, sclera flaps so in this uh, dissection of the sclera flap as i said you go usually 50% of the sclera thickness and uh, you go almost 3 mm all around now care must be taken that you don't go too deep especially when the sclera is thin now in this case as you can see the sclera is a little thin here you can see the water is uh, little prominently so i'll just show you what happens uh, you you do you do uh, start the dissection and at one point you see that the sclera bulges out so this situation needs to be avoided because here we didn't perforate this uh, choroid but the choroid is being uh, exposed and further dissection may be difficult at times especially if there is a puncture in the choroid in that case the eye becomes hypotonous there may be bleeding and all sorts of complications so you have to take care that you don't land up with the situation and one tip here is that the sharpness of your instrument has to be judged if you are using disposable instruments the sclera dissection knives are quite sharp and you have to be careful when you are dissecting so your first stroke which you make should be guarded you should know what the depth of the sclera is when you do the first stroke and then accordingly your next stroke should be taken now in this case though there was a choroidal knuckle we could manage to make the sclera bed 
without further perforating, but uh, it, it sometimes can get tricky. Now, once you have the dissect, you have dissected the blade for this implant technique, you would uh, select the buckle element, what you would need, the silicon buckle element. And as you all know, there are various companies who supply this and we use the standard Myra nomenclature for deciding the buckle. Like you say that you need a 279 or 280, but the various companies will have different uh, numbers. So don't go by the numbers. You select the company which you have and accordingly, you should know the, uh, the dimensions of the uh, buckle to place it. Once the main area of the buckle is decided, we would consider doing, as, as in a standard scattered buckle procedure, performing an encircling band going all around. And for this, we make scleral tunnels. We make them in all the other quadrants. In this case, we have dissected in the superior or temporal quadrant. So rest of the quadrants, we are making these scleral tunnels. And once we make the scleral tunnels in all quadrants, then we would start passing sutures to place the encircling uh, the main buckle element. Here, we are using 4-0 bond, or you can use 5-0 Dacron. I don't have any special interest in taking the names, but uh, this is what we practically do. So the sutures are passed. Now in an implant technique, that's an advantage because passing the sutures is much easier because you already have flaps and it's very unlikely that in this situation, you would damage the uh, sclera and perforate it and cause damage to the choroid and the retina. But if you are performing a Explant technique, you have to be careful at this stage when you are taking the sutures to hold the buckle element, then you have to be very careful that you don't cause any perforation, especially when you are taking the posterior bites, because if you cause a perforation, you have to go still more posterior to support those areas of perforation. So once you have taken sutures, you take the main buckle along with the encircling element. There is a groove in the buckle to place the encircling element. So you use that place the encircling element and pass the buckle under the sutures. Once that is done, the encircling element goes all around. It is passed through those scalar tunnels which you have already made. And it is uh, brought near the buckle element. So once this is done, you have place the buckle element under the sutures, you have taken the encircling element and it goes all around the globe and comes to the area where you have the broad buckle. That's where you usually tie the two ends of the encircling elements. So we have once we have placed the buckle, placed the encircling element, the next step in most situations would be to perform drainage of the subretinal fluid. Now, what are the indications of drainage? Most of the situations we would like to drain unless the retinal detachment is very shallow. The break is in the superior part and not in the dependent part. And uh, the site where you like to drain does not have much fluid. Usually you prefer to drain in the buckle bed over the horizontal rectile. That's the uh, ideal situation because in those areas, the coronal vessels are much smaller. And uh, you try to avoid areas where you are in proximity to the Vortices. So you can uh, select the area in case your uh, buckle element is in an um, area where there is not much of fluid, you could select some other area in the fluid, uh, other quadrants, and you can then later on suture that area of uh, drainage site. So here we have draining in the buckle element, the bed of the buckle element. And as you can see, now here we have with the help of the uh, dissection knife, we have exposed the scleral knuckle. Now you remember, you know that in this case that there was an additional uh, area of scleral uh, exposure, uh, uh, coronal exposure, but we didn't use that because it was a little anterior. So we wanted it in posterior and hence we made an additional uh, knuckle where we would now use it to drain. Now one important tip at this stage is that once you have exposed the uh, uh, coronal knuckle, you would avoid having the uh, eyeball pressure on the higher side. So you relax the uh, muscles which you are, being pulled, uh, you are assisting pulling. You have to specifically tell your assistant to sort of reduce the pull on the muscles and make it a little bit relaxed. So when you puncture the choroid, there is no gush of fluid. You would like the fluid to come gradually and steadily. 
So once that is done, I would usually use a, a ten zero needle to poke the choroid. You can also use an endo laser probe to uh, uh, apply laser to that area and cause uh, uh, opening in the choroid. Uh, rarely after the opening, there may be oozing, so you should keep a endodiathermy ready with your assistant so that in case you need to apply it, you can apply it immediately. So once you puncture the choroid, subretinal fluid starts draining, you use a cotton tip applicator to gradually guide the fluid through the break out and then gradually keep pulling the muscles so that your eye eyeball doesn't go into severe hypotony. So this is a preferably a gradually uh, done process and you have to be patient in removing the subretinal fluid. Now, it is also important that you should know how much fluid to expect. If you if have seen the detachment before, if you see no, it's very bullous, you expect a certain amount of fluid to come and by practice you know that you have drained adequately or not. One tip here is that at the end of the drainage, you start seeing the retinal pigment epithelium cells coming out through the drainage site. So that it gives you an indication that you are nearing the completion of your drainage process. If you poke the fluid and you get no fluid, it is called a dry fluid, then that indicates that the fluid is shifting. Or if you see some whitish tissue coming in there, that means your retina is getting incarcerated. In those situations, you should stop that, abandon that site for drainage, tighten the buckle over the drainage area. <coughs> Sorry and start looking for an other site for drainage. If you are lucky and if your drainage goes on well, then the next step would be to tighten up the scleral sutures and uh, even pull the acyclic element up so that your eyeball pressure is uh, adequately maintained and the eyeball doesn't go into hypotony. In case, sometimes, especially in old aphakic patients, I have seen that uh, whatever you do, even if you drain slowly, the you drain when you drain all the fluid the eyeball tries to sort of become uh, very hypotonous in that case you can either inject the silic uh, saline or balance out solution and or air into the uh, vitreous cavity with the help of a 30 gauge needle so that the eyeball integrity is maintained so the other point here is that how much you tighten so once you have pulled up the sutures you would take a temporary knot and then with the help of indirect ophthalmoscopy check the retina whether the retina is settled well there is whether additional fluid drainage is required or not if not you then look at the optic nerve will you see whether it is pulsating or not indicating if it's pulsating that indicates that your pressure from your temporary suture also is quite high so you should sort of relax it immediately get the central retina artery pulsation down see that it is perfusing well and then go ahead with the next step of the final tightening of the sutures. So once the sutures are finally tightened, then you pull up the encycling band. You can use a sling to uh, keep the encycling band together or you can use a slip knot to tighten the encycling elements together. And uh, once that is done, you trim them and tug it under the uh, scleral sutures. So once uh, this is done, that means most of your surgery, surgical part is over. So you can then give a good wash, thorough wash to the skeletal element and the encircling element so that no fibers or any other tissue remains with it, <coughs> which can then lead to infection. And you can even give an antibiotic wash to those areas around the, the, the buccal element, around the encircling element, and then pull up your conjunctiva and do the conjunctival closure. Your choice would can be a, any suture of your choice, but would you prefer something like 8-0 white ring, or you can also use uh, uh, glue if you are, have that facility with you. Conjunctival closure also should be done well because we don't want the areas to be open that may lead to subsequent uh, and uh, uh, disturbances with your tears uh, flow. Uh, flow. So doing a good conjunctival closure is extremely important and cannot be taken lightly. So having looked at these steps of performing sterile buccal surgery, uh, we can discuss why we really do a sterile buccal. I think it's most important part is that 
Scleral buckle does not disturb the internal milieu of the eye. Even with the modern day vitrectomy techniques, uh, performing a perfect vitrectomy and removing as much vitreous as possible is also not a very easy task. And it has its own complications. I think we'll be discussing that in the next talks. I won't go more into details of that now. And uh, during, during the discussion, we can uh, discuss more in details about the comparisons. But uh, usually not disturbing the internal milieu is an important point when you consider skeletal buckle surgery. And other uh, practical point is that you can do a skeletal buckle surgery with very basic equipment. You need a basic microscope and uh, other instruments to perform a skeletal buckle surgery are not very costly. The buckle elements and other things are also very cost effective. So the overall surgery becomes cost effective. So when you have to provide this for a particular type of economically backward classes, it is really good surgery to have in your kitty. Now, having said uh, about the surgery it's, uh, and that step, let us quickly look at the intraoperative complications which occur with skeletal buckle surgery because no surgery is complete without knowing about its complications. So as in any local anesthesia, you can perform, uh, you can have a globe perforation. But again, in sterile bucket, it is important because <coughs> most of the time, your patients would be highly myopic or at least moderately myopic most of the times. And in them, the sclera is thin and uh, your globe will be large. Sometimes there will be ectasia of the sclera. So you have to be very careful in planning uh, your blocks, you, you, peripheral block is preferable and uh, seeing that you get good anesthesia is also important because if not, the patient uh, is in discomfort throughout the surgery, which makes your life also difficult. Now, the next step is that you are, when you are marking the break, as I said, you don't use any sharp equipments to mark the break and see that you don't apply too much of pressure. You have to be, give the pressure gently. Otherwise, rarely, very rarely, I have seen in the last so many years, uh, Uh, in the last so many years, uh, we have seen only one situation where we, ha uh, we had a problem with uh, the. Just one second, this slide. Okay, so I just. Now, <clears throat> okay, so uh, the next uh, thing would be that uh, uh, when you're doing the scalar dissection, sometimes you can get a, a full thickness dissection as I showed you before, or you can, because of thin uh, sclera, your flaps may not be complete. So you can plan this beforehand. So if you, if you think that the sclera is thin, you can make sometimes what is called as a mini flaps. Uh, flaps good enough to just make the uh, sutures hold the buckle and not the full thickness, uh, full length flaps as you have shown, seen in the, uh, as I did in the uh, case which you have shown. Now, as I said, in cases of uh, implant technique where you have already dissected, cell perforation is a very, uh, not very common. But if you have if you're performing expand techniques, external perforation, perforation is a possibility, especially with uh, thin scleras. Now, uh, as I said, when you are doing uh, 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 drainage of the uh, fluid from the uh, subretinal space, we have discussed that you can get either dry hemorrhage. Dry drainage, hemorrhage, retinal castration, all these problems are there. So you have to be careful when doing this step. Now, now if you get a uh, Post drainage, if you see that the eye becomes hypotonous, you should quickly look inside the eye and you can at times see that there is already some uh, subretinal hemorrhage or there is a choroidal detachment. In that case, then again, you have to be, um, you have to do some maneuvers. If you see that there is a, 
uh, subretinal hemorrhage, you try to uh, shift the uh, eyeball a little bit away from the, so that the blood moves away from the sclera. And in the post-operative period, you can immediately make the patient sit up so that uh, he, uh, the blood goes more to the inferior periphery rather than staying at the macula itself. <clears throat> Now, in the early post-operative period, uh, with sclerosis buccal surgery, you are you have commonly have some dead edema, conjunctival chemosis. Another important thing you should remember is about the raised IOP. Usually, when you have a retinal detachment, the eye is hypotonus, and as soon as you drain the fluid, apply the sclerosis buccal, and tighten up the buccal, you are likely to get an increase in the IOP. So you have to watch that on table itself. If there is a raised IOP on table, you can do paracentesis and reduce it. Or in the sub, uh, subsequently in the post-operative period, a close watch on the IOP is important and considering uh, giving acetazolamide and other anti-glaucoma drugs also is an important thing to be remembered. Now, <clears throat> other thing which you can see in the early post-operative period following cell buccal surgery is a missed break. You did a detachment surgery, you on table, you thought the retina is nice and flat, your buccalite is good. But in the early postural period, you see that there is a fluid pocket which is coming up. And that's because of a small break which you have not covered. So there can be a uh, missed break. Or sometimes your buckle you, which you have placed, you felt on table that your break is getting well covered. Uh, but it may not occur so. So to reduce this problem, at times, you can uh, use what is called as a radial buckle as compared to a circumferential buckle. Usually, if you have, a, as you can see in the picture in the left, inferiorly, there is a large horseshoe shaped tear. So, these tears are not well supported with a circumferential buckle and you may land up with what is called as fish mounting of the buckle. And uh, to avoid that, we apply a radial buckle and that would take care of the problem. <clears throat> uh, other things is that uh, you can, as I said, as I said earlier, you can have a radial element as you see in this area, in, the, in this picture on the superior temporal part, we have placed a radial buckle and that has taken care of the horseshoe shaped tear. Uh, the late post-optic complications following uh, sterile buccal surgery can be uh, a persistent rise in the IOP, subretinal pigmentation, macular ERM or a macular pucker, and proliferative vitreoretinopathy. Now, these are some examples of uh, situations. Now, you can get a macular uh, ERM along with a lamellar hole. This usually occurs because when you do uh, probably cryopexy or you do handling of the tissues, uh, there is release of more pigment from this uh, bare RP and that leads to formation of epiretinal membranes or even other membranes leading to severe formation. Now, in this situation, as you can see, the buckle is uh, quite high, the break appears to be well sealed, but still there is formation of this PVR where you can see contractions in the retina, fixed folds in the inferior retina mm -hmm. leading to uh, recurrent detachment in the inferior area. The macula still is attached. Also, you should remember that uh, when you tighten up the buckle, especially with an encycling elements, you can compromise the vascular supply of the anterior segment as well as the posterior segment, leading to what is called as an anterior segment ischemia. So, this leads to uh, formation of corneal edema, desmet folds, flare in the uh, anterior chamber, with uh, subsequently it can lead to chronic hypotony and even cataract. So I've seen that uh, too high a buckle or too tight a buckle can lead to these complications. And even patients who report with fairly good vision ultimately because of this particular complication can lose that eye. Now in the uh, posterior segment ischemia, you can, along with anti-segment ischemia, you also see that the choroid and the outer retina is uh, affected leading to a patchy whitening of the outer retinal layers and later that turns out into a coarse mottling of the RP with yellow flecks. 
Other important thing which uh, occurs usually after an uneventful sterile buccal surgery is the refractive effects. Now, this is one point where sterile buccal surgery is being uh, sort of uh, shifted out and vitreum is preferred is because of these refractive changes. In most situations, especially because of the encircling element, there is a index induction of myopia and if the patient is already myopic, there is a myopic shift. And this is again, as I said, mainly because of the constricting effect of the encircling element. The other effect which we see commonly is that a hazy vitreous. Now, you know that uh, most of the time, uh, vitreous is a culprit in creating retinal breaks. And even if you settle the breaks, seal them, the vitreous remains hazy and the vitreous floaters remain. And that can make the patient unhappy because though his retina is attached, his vision is not very good and clear. So these are the one things which you cannot uh, sort of clear when you're doing a sterile buccal surgery. Your surgery has gone well, your retina is attached well, but the vitreous is not clear and the patient is not happy. And lastly, we talk about suture exposure. Now, when you place the sutures, as you can, as we saw in the case, these sutures over the period of time tend to poke out after the conjunctiva and start causing irritation to the patient. Even we have seen that uh, over the years, I, this I'm talking of maybe five to 10 years down the line, when you do a surgery, the buccal elements tend to move forward and they can be uh, seen near the limbus also at times. This is more common with the radial buckles, which tend to slip forward and tend to sort of protrude and the patient gets uh, a foreign body sensation constantly. And lastly, we have buccal infection. Now, usually over the years, I have seen that it is it occurs in about uh, three to five percent of the patients, and this is the this leads to chronic uh, irritation, discharge, and the conjunctiva starts gaping over the buckle. And that situation is better to remove the buckle in total along with the encircling element and give a thorough wash and suture the conjunctiva as much as possible. Sometimes the defect is large and you may not be able to suture it properly. In that case, you sort of suture it as much as possible to the episclera at least, and uh, that ultimately leads to healing of the wound. So to conclude, scleral buckle is a time-tested procedure. It has not changed much over the times, but still as a role, if we have a proper selection, it can give excellent anatomical and visual results. It's a procedure worth mastering for every upcoming wet retinal search. Thank you for your kind attention. So thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk. You have clearly explained us uh, when and how to do the scleral buckling procedure and a clear uh, pictorial depiction of all the steps of scleral buckling. So I would request all the viewers to post their queries in the chat box so that we can uh, take up all the session, uh, questions at the end of the session. So now we'll move on to the next session, which is the uh, role of vitrectomy in uh, retinal detachment by Dr. Jayashree Arun Prakash, ma'am. So Dr. Jayashree ma'am has more than 15 years of clinical experience and is currently working at Agarwal High Hospital, Coimbatore. Ma'am has completed her MBBS from Stanley Medical College, DNB from Arvind Eye Hospital, and no also had her no fellowship training at Arvind Eye Hospital, Coimbatore. She has performed more than 2,000 vitro retinal surgeries for simple and complex retinal conditions. She is an active member of the All India Ophthalmological Society, Vitro Retinal Society of India, and Tamil Nadu Ophthalmolic uh, Association. She is also an examiner for DNB assessment. Uh, uh, we welcome you, ma'am, and over to you, ma'am, to talk about uh, vitrectomy for retinal detachment. Thank you, Rekha, and. Uh... Uh, great thanks to the clinical board for giving me this opportunity. Uh, Dr. Nitin, that was an awesome presentation and uh, he's actually made my job very, very simple because uh, he's uh, spoken a lot about scleral buckle and also told all those conditions where uh, buckling is not possible and vitrectomy has to be done. Uh, he's actually spoken about both the presentations in a single shot. Uh, moving on to my presentation. Um, I'll just share my is my screen visible? 
Yes, ma'am, it is visible. Okay, so uh, after that extensive talk on uh, scleral buckle, we are now here to discuss the role of vitrectomy in retinal detachments. Um, actually, vitrectomy uh, has developed after scleral buckle, but in the last two decades, uh, vitreous surgery has uh, advanced very rapidly. And uh, hence, we now are in a position where we are able to operate on those retinal detachments, which were earlier considered to be inoperable by uh, just the procedure of scleral buckle. And now, vitrectomy has radically changed the progress, prognosis and the therapeutical uh, attitude so that uh, we are now uh, able to operate even on closed funnel retinal detachments and give the patients a chance of vision. Now, life is all about evolution and uh, uh, similarly, vitrectomy also has evolved from the early days in 1970 when Robert McKimmer first developed it and what he used was the VISC, the Vistress Infusion and Suction Cutter. This was the first closed system when a vitrectomy device with infusion and aspiration was used and it also controlled the intraocular pressure. Now, this was a monumental advance in ophthalmology because for the first time ever, this gave a controlled access to the vitreous and to the posterior segment of the eye. And initially, this procedure was used to clear the vitreous of opacity such as blood. But after that, there has been immense uh, advancement and there are better vitrectomy systems and better instrumentation. And so now vitrectomy is used for various procedures. Looking at the vitrectomy probe, the first probe that we ever had was a 17 gauge probe and the earlier 20 gauge probes only had a 400 cuts per minute uh, cut uh, rate and now uh, the latest probes that we have uh, started with the 20 gauge 1500 then 2500 cuts per rate and moving on to 23, 25. Now we have 27 gauge uh, cutters and uh, the cut rate is almost up to 10,000 cuts per minute. Now, the, why the cut rate is so important in a vitrectomy? We'll discuss a, a little bit of the basics of vitrectomy and then move on to retinal detachment. So looking at why the cut rate is actually very important, uh, what happens in the vitrectomy cutter is there is an on and off time. So uh, when the cutter is open, there is suction that is acting in the tissue, that is the vitreous is being pulled into the port. When the, um, when the probe shuts, uh, the uh, the tissue is cut that means the vitreous is cut so there is suction cut suction cut now if the cut rate is low the open time as well as close time is long and when the open time is long a lot of vitreous is being sucked in for a longer period of time which causes attraction on the vitreous and if you're working very close to the retina then there is a chance that the retina also may be sucked into the port with the uh, um, increase in the cut rate uh, Ma'am, the slides are not moving. Uh, is it visible for everyone or just for me? No, the slides are not moving. If it's if moving, we are oh, on the first slide only. Oh, sorry. I'll, maybe I'll start that again. Uh, which slide can you see now? Mem cut rate and tissue movement. Okay, so maybe I'll stay on this mode and not go to the slideshow. Uh, is it moving now? Hi, oh, yeah, ma'am. Next slide. Has it... Okay, fine. So uh, the, the previous thing was just about uh, the evolution of vitrectomy and the uh, vitrectomy probes. And uh, now I was talking about the cut rate. So when we have high cut rates, this results in less tissue pull, uh, less amount of suction so that we can actually work very, very close to the retina. And now th this combination of a high uh, speed cutting and a low flow, this helps to reduce the fluidic disturbance. And because of this, uh, even while working on a mobile retina, that is on the surface of a mobile retina, we have an advantage that the retina stays in place and it is not sucked into the uh, cutter. And this is why now the indications of vitrectomy have actually increased. So coming to uh, the indications of vitrectomy per se in a retinal detachment, 
uh, Nitin sir has already spoken about it, the breaks that are difficult to identify, very large breaks, posterior breaks or a retinal detachment because of macula hole, numerous breaks in different meridia, a GRT, and uh, see, high myopes uh, is a, you know, you can go for scleral buckle or for vitrectomy, depending on the condition of the eye. Now, if there is a myope, uh, a young myope who has developed a retinal detachment because of a lattice with a hole and does not have a PVD, then it would be better to go in for a scleral buckle as uh, has always been, uh, has already been told. This is because induction of PVD will be a difficult, that too in a long globe and in a myopic eye. Uh, but in case there is a vitreal, uh, vitreous gel collapse and there are a lot of vitreous floaters, then if we go in for a scleral buckling, then these floaters will always be there and the disturbance is always going to be there. So it's better that we go for vitrectomy in these cases. And when there is a traction on the brakes, as in the, as, uh, in the case of incarcerated vitreous or uh, presence of PVR and uh, local epiretinal membranes. So um, most of these indications, it is always uh, better to go in for a vitrectomy rather than a scleral buckle. Basically, the benefits of vitrectomy would be to improve the visualization, to relieve the vitreoretinal traction, to enable access and to facilitate tampon out. Looking at each one of these, so accurate identification of the retinal breaks is the prerequisite of a successful retinal reattachment surgery so there is no way that our surgery is going to uh, be a success if we don't in cases like aphakic eyes where, where the pupil does not uh, dilate much and these breaks in the, uh, the breaks in these eyes are usually very small in the periphery if we are not able to identify it we becomes and there are retinal folds and the breaks are located within these folds it will be difficult to identify the breaks and when there is uh, when there are opacities in the ocular media um, similarly presence of pvr and uh, presence of uh, epiretinal membranes um, now the problem is that uh, if the if the vitreous and these membranes are not removed, there's always uh, the risk of reopening of the breaks or presence uh, or uh, occurrence of new breaks in the post-operative period. So in the in case of presence of vitreoretinal traction, it's better to go in for vitrectomy and for where you need a better access to the retina, uh, which is in case of all the uh, difficult breaks and in case of uh, pre-retinal membranes, especially in case of subretinal membranes. So subretinal membranes, there's no way that uh, you can access the subretinal membranes without entering the posterior uh, compartment, accessing the vitreous. And then you have to remove these membranes either through the existing breaks or via planned retinotomies. Uh, now there is a shift towards primary PPV in cases of retinal detachment. Even in those cases of retinal detachments where earlier we would have done a scleral buckle, but now uh, many surgeons prefer to do a primary vitrectomy. The reasons for these are, the, are basically the technological advances. That is, there is a greater safety in doing a vitrectomy now as compared to the earlier days when the uh, advancements were not so good in instrumentation and viewing system. We now have wider viewing systems and also better training. Uh, in most of the fellowship, what happens now is uh, most of the indications for retinal surgeries are vitrectomy, whether we are operating on macular holes or epiretinal membranes or diabetic cases, we are doing vitrectomies most of the times and doing scleral buckle only in cases of uh, selected cases of retinal detachment. And because of this, the newer vitro-retinal surgeons that are now being trained are more confident doing vitrectomies than they are confident doing scleral buckle. And this is probably one of the reasons there is a shift towards vitrectomy and also improved capabilities because we are doing a lot of uh, vitreous surgery now. Uh, the advantages uh, would be all the other, among all the others, uh, the most important in the current scenario would be that there is not much change in refraction, especially in pseudophagic patients who've got uh, toric IOLs or multifocal IOLs placed. After a scleral buckle, uh, invariably there will be a myopic shift. That is because of elongation of the globe. And also the uh, keratometric readings will change because we have a wider buckle placed in one region or a radial buckle sitting somewhere and then an insert so there is a lot of change in uh, the refractive correction also. And luckily, we are now in the era where uh, post vitrectomy or post retinal surgery, we are now able to give a 6-6 vision. So these changes become more important now than it was in the previous days. 
Uh, apart from that, vitrectomy definitely has an edge over scleral buckle in patients with thin, thin sclera, uh, prior squint surgery, patients with filtering blebs and vanish devices, and uh, all the difficult uh, blebs. Now, uh, there are some misconceptions about uh, vitrectomy. Basically, that inferior breaks cannot be supported well by doing a uh, vitrectomy or that you know you need a longer uh, tamponade maybe a long acting gas or silicone oil is required in all the cases and which requires a second surgery and also prone positioning required for a long time but there are a lot of studies now which have proved that inferior breaks do have a, a favorable outcome uh, in case of a primary regmatogenous retinal detachment when it is managed with vitrectomy also that short acting gas tamponades or um, uh, C3F8 can be easily used in most of the uh, simpler uh, retinal detachments and even SF6 can be used for uh, sometimes. Uh, also the prone positioning, uh, a max would be up to one week, five to seven days of prone positioning would be required in most of the patients. And after that, we would not require the positioning. Uh, so coming to the steps of the surgery, I will play the uh, is the video visible? Uh, no, ma'am. We can just see the slide. Uh, is it visible? Uh, yeah, ma'am. Now it is visible. Okay. So this particular surgery is for a myopic retinal detachment in a uh, pseudophagic patient, and I'm doing a 25 kg vitrectomy. So uh, the, all the advantages start from the first step itself. That now this is a transconjunctival surgery; does not require peritomy, and the incisions are very small, less than about 0.25 millimeter incisions. Uh, so we make three ports. The first one is the infusion in the infrotemporal and then two superior ports, the supranasal and the suprotemporal, which are made about one clock hour superior to the horizontal meridian because this would, uh, and then the, we would be able to uh, handle the tissue better and the hand movements will be easier. And then once we go in, uh, we prefer to do the anterior vitrectomy first under direct visualization. That is, the anterior vitreous face is first uh, uh, cut using the cutter. And then we gradually go in and do the core vitrectomy. So this is uh, a myopic patient. You can see the floaters. The uh, core vitrectomy is being done. And then we go on to the mid-peripheral vitrectomy. So more, this patient has a lot of lattices with horseshoe tears in the mid periphery. You can see one uh, horseshoe tear here. For infusion, we usually use a BSS plus uh, solution. When we're doing the core vitrectomy, we use a high cut rate and high suction, but going to the mid peripheral vitreous and the peripheral vitrectomy where we are uh, working very close to the retina, uh, the suction is reduced. Now, this is another horseshoe tear that you can see, which is close to the lattice. Most of these are in the mid periphery in case of this patient. What we would do is all the horseshoe tears are converted into holes by cutting the flap and the vitreous attachments to the edge of the lattices and around the hole is uh, shaven uh, very close to the retina. This is because we do not want much of residual vitreous gel uh, around the lattices or around the holes, which can then, you can see that clearly now, acting on the edge of the lattice, you can see that I'm almost cutting on the surface of the retina because, because we do not want any residual vitreous there, which can lead to PVR membranes later. So this is done uh, all around, all 360 degree, and then we start the peripheral vitrectomy. Uh, that's the peripheral vitrectomy. A scleral depression is being done. Here we would like to reduce the IOP a little so that the scleral depression can be facilitated. And then 
again work very close to the retina, shave most of the vitreous base almost up to the aura. If there are any membranes, uh, pre-retinal membranes or epiretinal membrane, subretinal membrane, then we would like to remove all those membranes and then go for a peripheral base shaving. So 360 base shaving done, and then identify all the breaks and lay, use endodiathermy to mark the breaks. This is because once the fluid air exchange is done, we may not be able to identify the smaller breaks uh, in the breaks and use uh, diathermy to mark the breaks. We also check the 360 periphery once again to see if you've missed out on any breaks. There I'm checking the periphery to see if these are the only breaks or if whether I have missed out on anything. Now, uh, there's a small PFCL that I have put on the posterior retina because I do not want the fluid to track to the posterior pole. This patient had a posterior staphyloma, and it becomes very difficult when there's a posterior staphyloma. The fluid goes and sits there, and the absorption takes a long time. So a PFCL is placed on the posterior pole. You can see that bubble there. And I have started the fluid air exchange which means that air is now entering the vitreous cavity and we are sucking out the fluid from the vitreous cavity. And we would like to place the probe uh, near the hole or the retinal break so that the, all the subretinal fluid gets aspirated. We may like to make the break a little dependent. So the air remains on the surface, all the fluid tracks down to the break and it is aspirated out of the retinal break. The, this is now a little bit clear. So you tilt the globe towards the break, make the break dependent. The retina is now dry. Once you feel that the retina is dry, there's no more fluid, then you go to the posterior pole. I'm checking all the breaks and seeing if I can aspirate any further fluid. What is shining on the posterior pole? There is a PFCL bubble. That is liquid perfluorocarbon, and I'm now sucking out the PFCL. started lasering now. First, you go to all the breaks and cover the breaks all around with laser, with at least three to four uh, rows of endo laser. Let's make this faster. All the breaks are lasered. Around the breaks, we would like to have confluent burns, but then when we do a 360 uh, endo laser barrage, we do not generally want confluent burns. We can have burns that are one burn width apart, basically because a lot of laser would lead to uh, inflammation and can lead to membranes on the surface of the retina. So because this was mid-periphery, I did one uh, laser around all the uh, lattices and the breaks. And periphery close to the aura, I'm doing a second, laser, uh, second layer of laser. So laser is completed here. The 360 laser has been done and silicon oil is being injected.
So this is silicone oil being injected into the vitreous cavity. All the air is let out and there's a complete fill. Now, while filling the silicone oil, we have to be careful that uh, there is no underfill and no overfill also. I'm checking the IOP digitally because I don't want an overfill of silicone oil because that may lead to glaucoma in the post-operative period. And we'll have to, if uh, that will be intractable, glaucoma cannot be relieved with medications and we'll have to remove a part of the silicone oil if it is because if it's too tight a globe. So check the uh, IOP at the end of the surgery. And then here the cannulas are removed. It's a self-sealing incision. If we have an underfill, the inferior portion of the eye will not be filled when the patient is sitting up. And all the inflammatory uh, uh, mediators can get collected there, which can lead on to an inferior PVR. So the surgery is almost complete. And at the end, we would give a subconjunctival injection of uh, cefazolin with decadran. And on a cataract surgery was done or uh, no surgery done for that matter. So we went through all these steps, the core vitrectomy. In case there was no PVD, we would have to induce PVD. Can you see my PPT now? Yes, ma'am, it is visible. Yeah, okay. And then mid-peripheral vitrectomy, shaving of the peripheral vitreous and examination of the peripheral retina is the single most important step in case of vitrectomies, be it for retinal detachment or diabetic vitrectomy or macular hole or whatever. Examination of the peripheral retina 360 degree by depression is mandatory before you close the eye because there may be uh, inadvertent retinal holes, PVD induced retinal holes that you would have missed. So definite, definitely the periphery must be examined before uh, closing the eye at least once and uh, more than once also in case you're not very sure. Then endodiathermy of the brakes, fluid air exchange, endolaser, and tamponade. A tamponade can be silicon oil, or as I said, it can be C3F8 or SF6. Now, coming to the use of liquid uh, perfluorocarbon, indications would be to stabilize uh, the retina in case of a large tear, uh, such as a GRT, or where you're going to do relaxing retinotomy in case of um, PVR, where, where the retina is very stiff and is not settling. So we would do a relaxing retinectomy. That is, we will cut off a part of the peripheral retina uh, so that the retina settles down. And in these cases, uh, we, would, we would like to stabilize the posterior retina by using PFCL. And in case of very peripheral breaks where the fluid cannot be uh, aspirated during fluid air exchange and the fluid is likely to track to the posterior pole and it is a bullous RD, then uh, when we inject PFCL, the fluid comes up to the break and aspiration becomes easier. Now, injecting the PFCL, uh, we have to be careful because this is a heavy liquid. And uh, what happens is if we uh, direct the injection towards the retina, it is likely that a retinal hole or, or a retinal damage may occur at that area because of the direction of the injection. So we have to inject usually on the optic nerve head and very slowly. And also while injecting the PFCL, you have to make sure that either uh, the infusion port is open or some other port is open because the air or fluid that is inside the eye has to escape. Otherwise, the intraocular pressure will go very high. So you stop the infusion, the, you open that port, and then you gradually uh, uh, inject the PFCL. Also, don't inject the PFCL on the macula. Don't direct the PFCL towards the direction of the break in case of a posterior break. And if the retina is very tight, also, don't do a complete PFCL fill because if the retina is stiff, it is not going to settle. It's not going to sit down with the PFCL. And there is a chance that the PFCL may go sub under the, in the subretinal space. So injecting of PFCL has to be done uh, very carefully. And we don't use it for every case. It has to be used selectively only for certain cases. Now, the role of additional belt buckle in vitrectomy uh, in it, it is used in cases of uh, young phakic patients where peripheral vitrectomy may not be very easy and uh, not satisfactory. 
not not very easy would not be the right word i mean uh, we the, we as surgeons will not be satisfied that we have done sufficient peripheral vitrectomy this is because of the presence of the lens now because of uh, depression and wider view we can still access the peripheral retina but it would be safer to put in a belt buckle uh, if the patient is young and phakic again in cases of pathological myopia where uh, the induction of pvd and taking the pvd beyond the equator may be difficult in some cases and in cases of anterior pvr uh, disadvantages of vitrectomy would be that uh, yes we need uh, complex and expensive equipment and uh, there may be some uh, complications by the procedure itself that is present uh, iatrogenic retinal breaks or uh, lens touch during uh, vitrectomy entry site breaks um, and then the disadvantages due to tamponade so there may be a gas cataract because if the patient does not maintain a proper prone position in case of gas tamponade then the gas comes in touch with the posterior part of the lens and uh, results in a gas cataract uh again uh, there are restrictions on flying for patients in whom gas has been used they are not supposed to fly or go to high altitudes for till the time that the gas has been completely absorbed this is because at a higher altitude uh, the gas expands so the intraocular pressure may become very high and the patient experiences severe pain and uh, sudden rise in iop uh, post operative position posturing and positioning may not be possible in some patients uh who's got spinal issues or very old patients so that has to be taken in, into account before uh, deciding on what surgery we are going to do and all this has to be clearly explained to the patient before going for surgery thank you for the patient hearing so thank you ma'am thank you so much sir thank you for the valuable time it's been a great learning experience so we now clearly know which patient should be taken for spiral buckling and which for vitrectomy so thank you all thank you all for the participation uh, if anyone has any queries they can even email us and we'll get back to you so thank you all and have a good day